So these people back in the early 80s, they, many scientists and uh, people in the movie industry were trying to, knew that there might be a possibility of a pole shift. They thought the pole shift might be caused by a huge, by, by an alignment of planets, of Jupiter lining up with Saturn, lining up with Mars and Earth, and it, they thought that a combined gravitational pull of all these planets in the year 2000 would pull the Earth off of its axis and cause global destruction. They didn't know about Planet X then, but they were on the right track. So they wanted to find proof that this pole shift had occurred in the past. So they got Alex Tannis, and Alex Tannis on, the, on his videotape says, I went into the Bermuda Triangle. A part of me went out of my body and swam deep beneath the ocean. And I saw the most marvelous ancient civilization down below the ocean. I saw marble staircases, spiral staircases, marble columns, marble roadways. It was the most pyramids. It was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in my life. He did an out-of-body experience. I mean, I've never believed in that, but I can see the proof of it <clears throat> from the, from the uh, testimony of Alex Tannis. And uh, then in this videotape, they said well, a lot of people did not believe Alex Tennis, but we went out to the coordinates where he had described to us, which he had described to us, 40 miles off the coast of Florida. It's called the Bimini Road. And sure enough, they found a 1,000-yard-long road made of marble. Of course, it's now encrusted with coral and everything. But when he saw it in his vision, he saw it as it existed thousands of years ago before it sunk beneath the sea. It was a part of it. It was then a part of the ancient continent of Atlantis. And he, uh, they, they stopped the boat right there, and they used sonar to look down, and they detected this undersea pyramid with the capstone missing. So with the capstone missing, that tells you that this was Illuminati. This was the ancient occult practice that was being that was worshipped and followed thousands of years ago so the evil evil mankind has not changed because the same evil spirits that ruled mankind over the millennia are at work creating these occult worship symbols such as the pyramid without the capstone but they use sonar and they look down and you actually see on the videotape a video sonar picture of a pyramid deep on the ocean bottom, 40 miles off the coast of Florida. This pyramid has no capstone. It's just incredible, and you have to believe it. So there's and more evidence that the earth was sunk. Yeah, I was just going to say that should uh, be enough for people to realize. And I think what a lot of people feel is, you know, they, they you know, especially when you're young, you've got this feeling of indestructibility, like, well, that, that can't happen because I'm here. And I have news for people. Well, it doesn't matter who's here. <laughs> when it's going to happen, it's going to happen, and it is going to happen at some point. Well, you know, it seems that some point is getting close to us in time yeah. right now. Because if you talk to some of the young people that you know we think are we have a you, you're right, young people have this feeling of eternality, uh, indestructibility. But if you see some of them, and many, many thousands, and a growing number are being subjected to these horrible weather disasters entire houses and we've all seen it it's horrible it's sad it's tragic we feel for those people but these young people see their house turned into a pile of debris wreckage so grotesque that you just can't imagine how could they ever clean up all that wreckage that was once a house and now they've got no place to live those people are painfully aware of how destructive this world is becoming the weather the tornadoes are super tornadoes now. It's all evidence. It's all evidence right before your eyes in living color. And some people, unfortunately, people have actually felt the pain of the evidence. Super tornadoes, miles wide. It never used to be that wide. Tornadoes used to be much narrower. Tornadoes were never never had the high wind speeds that they do now. No, it looked like the last hurricanes one was on the land, though. Yes, that's another thing. Land hurricanes, they call them derechos. 
Derechos were, I never even heard of a derecho in all my life. And now we're getting them. Um, but these hurricanes, the one that destroyed uh, more Oklahoma, oh, how tragic. That had wind speed of around 300 miles an hour. I mean, it's, you know, that's a circular rotational speed. I mean, that is incredible. I mean, that's a record. I think that broke a record. There was no, nothing ever has been recorded at that high of velocity, no tornado. And the yeah, wind you know, miles wide. John, I've looked at, you know, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, I always thought of tornadoes as these, you know, somewhat small funnel clouds and, and if you were in its path, you were in trouble. But, you know, now it's like, like you said, they're so wide that, you know, you're going to be in its path. It's it's like, like we just said, it's like a hurricane just traveling across land. It's unbelievable. I, I tell you, I watch the Weather Channel, and sometimes I cannot believe what I'm seeing. And I think a lot of, you know, especially the younger people, again, they look at this and they, they don't know any different. They think it's normal. It's far well. from normal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, uh, here's another crazy anomaly that shows the Earth is in trouble. These experienced weather uh, hurricane or tornado chasers, these tornado chasers, uh, were they were playing it safe. They knew that if you stay on the south side, I think they, the Weather Channel was saying this, if you stay on the south side of the tornado, you're okay because the tornado always moves toward the northeast. However... For the first time ever, the tornado, instead of moving northeast, it moved south. And it killed three very dedicated, experienced tornado hunters. Yeah. Boy, so the weather is getting horrible. The flooding is epic levels. I mean, record flooding over and over again. It, you know, far more than we've ever had in the past, far greater water levels. Cars being washed away day after day. You see this all over the country. I can't even begin to tell you all the different places that have been severely flooded, homes destroyed. We all, you know it, you see it. I don't even have to go into details, oh, yeah. right? And then the drought. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right next door, one state away, you'll have a drought where the ground is so cracking so much, a long-term drought, that the, the ground is shrinking and cracking and the foundation of the house is collapsing because the earth is so dry. That's close, right? you know, adjacent to a flooded area. A flooded area. Yeah. So it's really, we know the earth is in trouble. We don't even have to, I mean, I could go on, we could go on and on and spend two hours talking about the weather anomalies. If people will believe, they have to, that the earth is in big trouble. And uh, getting back real quick, I'll give you my theory, and I've written this up formally and trying to present it to many people who uh, might pass it on to others so as to warn the world. I, my theory that I began to explain before as to what is happening to Earth's magnetic field. Well, the magnetic field is getting messed up because of the swirling molten iron core of the Earth that I talked about before. Uh, the the Earth's solar winds blasting and impinging upon Earth's magnetic field, the electromagnetic energy from those solar winds impacting Earth's magnetic field is feeding back, just like in, for, from the skin of the apple into the core of the apple, into Earth's core, and that energy is not only heating up the Earth's core, but it's putting a force, budging force, nudging force on the solid iron core at the very center of the Earth, which is immersed in the liquid molten iron core. That center iron core, that pit, more or less, of the Earth is getting nudged off of its center. And as it gets nudged off center, what happens? It Instead of sitting there in the middle and just rotating nicely, and allowing the molten iron core to swirl nice, nice and evenly in a swirling motion like, like your blender, what happens is that the iron core gets shifted off center, and now the iron core is not only rotating daily, but it's revolving. And that's why you see the jet stream looking like a uh, huge wavy roller coaster, if you look at the weather map on the Weather Channel. The jet stream always looks like a huge roller coaster. Never used to look like that decades ago. Not supposed to look that way. That, according to my theory, is because the Earth's solid iron core has been shifted by this magnetic energy, electromagnetic energy from the solar winds feeding back into the core, shifting the core off center. And now we've got like, hey, you, you remember seeing a jumping jack, right? Jumping jacks when you're... Oh, yeah. What mm -hmm. it is, it's like, a, it's like an empty capsule, like a pill capsule with nothing in it, but... It has a little ball bearing, 
so that ball bearing can shift the weight of the of the of the empty capsule, and it looks like it's a jumping as it, as the ball bearing rolls inside of the empty capsule. Well, in a similar vein, you have this ball rolling around, rotating around, and causing all that molten iron that should be swirling nice and smoothly, causing the molten iron to slosh around and form waves. Now, the molten iron itself is what generates the magnetic field because the molten iron is comprised of free electrons. Iron is an electrical conductor, and when you melt it, all the free electrons that would normally flow through, like in a wire, those free electrons are moving. And we know what moving electrons, swirling electrons, constitute. It constitutes electric current. You can create current, electric current by taking a bunch of a lot of electrons and s stirring them up in a big circle if you had the power to do that. Uh, stirring up like you would stir your coffee with a stirring stick. Okay, all these electrons, like you're stirring coffee in a stirring stick, they would sm swirl in the molten iron, and the movement circular movement of this mass of free electrons in the iron, in the molten iron, would constitute an electric current. Now, when you have this swirling electric current inside the Earth's core, that's what generates the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth. So if that solid iron ball at the center of the Earth gets knocked off center by the sun's impacting electromagnetic energy, then that solid ball gets starts to move around, is off center, it starts to slosh around and create waves in the molten iron, swirling molten iron. So now you've got a wavy, sloshy molten iron. Now if it's the molten iron sloshes enough as that ball moves farther and farther away from the center and that ball moves farther closer to the edge of the molten iron swirl, now the, the, earth, the sloshing of that molten core gets so accentuated, so uh, uh, radical, that you have waves that fall, fall back on one another. Now some of that swirling molten iron is going in the opposite direction. Instead of swirling you know, like clockwise, some of it is sloshing back in huge waves, curling waves like surfer waves that go back in the opposite direction. Well, that generates a reverse magnetic field. So the polarity, instead of going from north to south, goes from south to north. And that's how you get a pole reversal. That's my theory. Nobody yeah. else has ever put that out, to my knowledge. And that's my personal theory, and I believe it's true, and I'm hoping that others will see it and examine it to let us know that, hey, this yeah. is why we're getting all this. The Earth's solid core is off-center because of the sun, blasting from the sun. Yeah, and I, I should also add that magnetic field, as we know, protects us uh, dearly. And, um, you know, shields are down. We're vulnerable. Yes, and uh, we've right. got a we've we've got a call, John, and I want to take it. Uh, but uh, go ahead and comment if you wanted to. But uh, yeah, uh, shields down. <laughs> yep. All right, Kath, Kathleen in Florida, you are on the air. Welcome aboard. Hi, everybody. This is awesome. This is a great show. I love Hi. it. Thank um, you. I grew up in South Florida near the Bermuda Triangle, and. Um, there was always stories about compasses going crazy and, uh, you know, boats losing connection with, you know, their radios and stuff like that. But um, I went to high school from the year 79 to 82. And during one point, one of our friends was out on a boat fishing with another guy, and they never came home. And they never found the boat, and no one ever knew. I mean, they just disappeared virtually, so... Um, I guess there was a, I, I would say probably like a year or two that went by, and um, my friend and I were in a car driving by his house, because he only lived a couple a couple blocks away. And um, it was always kind of weird, you know, when we drove by, because he had a brother, and his brother was still there, but, you know, he, our friend was gone. And um, it was dark, and we were going past his house, and there was like a little cloud, probably about the size of, like if you put your arms in a big circle in front of you, no bigger than that, maybe kind of an oval shape. A cloud. Not thick, yeah, not thick and not thin. But we just drove by, you know, we just drove by his house at residential speed, you know. And all of a sudden, this cloud came from his yard and came across the street and went underneath my vehicle um, right where the driver's side door was and then went underneath and then went out 
from the passenger side underneath the car. And my friend, my best friend, was driving with me, and I said, did you see that? And she said, yeah. And we just were like, whoa, you know. And we just assume that, you know, that was our friend. But um, when you talk about the Bermuda Triangle and all those disappearances and stuff from years ago, and now you talk about how they found the pyramids underneath there and stuff, do you think that has any connection? Uh, it very well might. Uh, it's, hard. It's, a, it's a great mystery. And and stuff? I'm sorry, what? You think that has any connection what, with the pyramid that they found, you know, just what you were talking about? It's and, a great uh, mystery. It's a great mystery, really. I have not st- have not studied it, so I wouldn't want to make any kind of statements. But certainly, I've had uh, some. Spe- I have some speculation. It could be related to large magnetic deposits, iron deposits beneath the seabed, around there, and it could very well be also be related to the civilization that existed, that was sunk, off the coast of Florida. You, you're, you may be right. Uh, we know they had advanced technology back during the time of Atlantis, this great ancient empire that, uh, which is very much was very much like our current United States, in high technology and great world. It was a great world power. They had weaponry, uh, and I should really refer to uh, some of the Edgar Casey, the great sleeping prophet. This psychic is is accepted even by scientists. I spoke of him just a while ago. But Edgar Casey, in his trances, he talked about uh, have, what happened in Atlantis thousands of years ago before the great sinking of Atlantis. And he mentioned crystals that they used. They had a more advanced technology that used crystals. And uh, it was dealing with energy weapons and, and all kinds of weird stuff, which our government... Believe it or not, it must be true because our government has secretly sought this ancient technology. So you may be right. There may be something magnetic or some kind of substance that was related to that ancient advanced technology that they had because there was a pyramid off the coast. They did indeed discover at least one pyramid 40 miles off the coast of Florida. Now, where exactly where was the location? Was it near the Bimini Road? Which I well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure exactly where the Bimini Road is, but when we were kids, um, the um, Bermuda Triangle, probably so, the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle is what we were always told was off the coast, um, and I lived in Boca Raton, so it was not too far off the coast of where I was, and then there was a, a triangle, you know, three points that were, you know, where all these things had taken place, where they just kind of, referred to that as the Bermuda Triangle. So that was off the coast of Boca Raton, Raton right? About how yeah, many well, miles? Not About far. how many miles off the coast? Not, not far, and I can't, I can't remember exactly, but we always knew that it was there, and I've been over it many times. I've been fishing in it many times, and we had never ourselves experienced anything weird. But, you know, we used to make jokes about it and stuff. And then, you know, when our friend went missing, we thought that was really bizarre. Well, when but, you look um, at the, the records of, of all the planes that were lost over there, mm-hmm. it seems their instrumentation w- went haywire when they right, got over right. that Bermuda Triangle. So it could very well be something magnetic that was affecting it. But now how would, the, how would magnetism cause that boat to capsize? Um, it could be whirlpools. Uh, have you ever noticed any disturbances in that water uh, when you or anyone else was out there? In fact, you may be able to read stories about the many people who have been boating out there if they have noticed any whirlpools or any turbulence, unusual turbulence that has occurred, is there something like that that you know of? Some well, I, per- I personally saw a water spout while I was driving down A1A, and it was probably 100 feet off the coast, maybe 200, maybe two or 300 feet, and it was really tall. Probably, I can't tell you how tall it was. It wasn't like a mile or anything, but we could see it while we were driving down A1A, which is well, not a world, not only a whirlpool, but a, an air cy- cyclone or a right. small uh, tunnel, a funnel class, I should say, just like a mini tornado that people might not even notice it. It might come up from the sea, and I'm just speculating, but it's but the speculation is based upon principles of electricity and magnetism and how that would affect, create whirlpools, because we do have air is charged electrically. We know that when moisture rises uh, into the clouds, what does it do? It carries with it electrons, and those electrons build up in the cloud eventually discharging to Earth as lightning. So we know there's electrical effects in the air. Now, if this magnetic field were to 
for, uh, create a vertical column that goes upward through the water and above the water, it could disturb the air and cause a circular motion. We know that many hurricanes have that, have that circular motion from the ionosphere discharging to the, to the salt water. Salt water is a very good conductor of electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that disturbance could cause a whirlpool, a mini tornado that could take the boat, flip it up in the air, and capsize it. Right, but they of second. never found it. They never found it. It was never, ever found. Right, so if it got caps, capsized in that way, either by turbulent, a little turbulent funnel cloud that was created maybe for a short period of time, or by a vortex swirling whirlpool in the water that was created for a short term time, like it's called an eddy, uh, that it would also cap, could capsize the boat and sink it rapidly. You know, and I wonder, John, if it's possible that the magnetic force could be so strong that it just, you know, like an MRI, if you've got metal in your body, it'll rip it out. If maybe at times it gets so strong that uh, something with steel on it or what have you, a plane, a boat, and it just sucks them down. Right, and that's a good point because, uh, you know, regarding your problem, uh, your story, Kathleen, is it Kathleen? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, regarding your story, uh, and Michael just caused me to realize that planes are also taken down by the Bermuda Triangle. Planes have disappeared. And mm -hmm. so it was may not even have been a vortex of water, but just a cyclone or a funnel cloud that was created momentarily, and that took the plane and just brought it down and just pulled it right down through the funnel into the ocean. And that's maybe perhaps how so many planes have been lost. So just from the many disappearances of airplanes, we can probably make a – educated guess that it's caused by turbulent air, which is electrically generated somehow by something beneath the seabed. <clears throat> well, you know what got my mind wondering was when you said that, because um, I didn't know this until we were speaking of it a few minutes ago, about the ancient civilization that they found, and isn't that kind of where the Bermuda Triangle would be? You said, what did you call it, Bermuda Row? Oh, the Bimini Road, yeah, it's Bimini? probably in okay, that area. I don't, know, I don't know how far up the coast, but I know it was 40 miles off the coast of Florida that they discovered the Bimini Road. Well, then, Bimini isn't too far from the Bahamas and, and Florida, so I wonder if that's actually included in, in the Bermuda Triangle the way they used to have it mapped out. But um, another thing that started making me think was um, there was a gentleman on the show last night speaking of the, what is it, the yellow box? The yellow, yeah. what is it? Yep, and the yellow box. Were ancient machines and stuff, and I'm wondering that if maybe one of those things may have been in operation um, and underneath in that city from ancient times, and may have still been in operation, or maybe something set it off and it made it work. Because uh, isn't that part of like time travel, or you know, like magnetic force or magnetic field associated with that too? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, theory to, to investigate. Wonder. I haven't studied it, so I don't know. But I know, uh, you know, from the studies of Atlantis, they did have this high technology that utilized crystals. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I'll bet there are people who have been studying this today, especially we have many researchers in this area, that of the field of uh, ancient knowledge that you're referring to that might shed more light on this situation. But, you know, yeah. a couple things come to mind is that fact that many – coastal areas have been sunk. It's not just off the coast of Florida, but it's also 2,000 feet off the coast of Cuba. 2,000 feet deep off the coast yeah. of Cuba, they found land masses sunk. They found land masses sunk off the coast of Japan. And also off the northern coast, James McCanney has stated a number of times, off the northern coast of Australia, the U.S. Navy has been conducting secret salvage operations of the lost continent of Atlantis sunk off the northern coast of Australia. So this is all around the world that these yeah. sunken coastal cities have been found, and you would expect that. When you stop and think of what happens, when now just picture the Earth as a huge, the way I, I like to make things is graphic, uh, give graphic examples so people can see vivid pictures in their minds. Picture the Earth as a huge balloon filled with jello. Now, assuming that the, you know, the balloon would have to be pretty strong to hold all that jello. Now you rotate the balloon, just as the Earth rotates. What would happen to the shape of the balloon? What would your mind's eye tell you? What happens to the shape of the balloon as that balloon is rotating the way the Earth rotates? Yeah, it would, would it remain round? A little bit. 
stretch. So it would not remain round, right? Would stretch and get oblong. Right. The, the, the equatorial area of that balloon would bulge out, and it would appear. It would, and the, the poles, the north and the south pole, would flatten out, right? So you'd have mm-hmm. like a flattened, yeah. widened circle, sort of almost like a, a tire, an automobile tire laid sideways. Okay, so now what happens is a planet comes by, a huge dwarf star. Now this dwarf star, incidentally, because the scientists, before they were muzzled, scientists such as Dr. Harrington, the late Dr. Harrington, and others said they believe that this object is a brown dwarf star that's being gravitationally pulled into or toward our sun. If you look up the definition of a brown dwarf star, the puniest brown dwarf star is about three Jupiter masses. One Jupiter mass is 318 Earth masses. So three Jupiter masses is some, getting close to 1,000 Earth masses. This 1,000 Earth mass dwarf star comes by Earth. It exerts a gravitational pull as it passes over Earth like a bowler would put a spin on a ball. And it jerks the North Pole southward. So that now the North Pole, and we talked about, remember, Toronto was at one time, Toronto and Minnesota were one time at the North Pole. Well, it takes that North Pole where it exists today, which is frozen, and it moves it southward in a matter of an hour as it passes by. So now the bulgy part of the Earth is no longer in the same position, but was the equatorial bulge now becomes a different portion of the earth so you got a new equator that's formed and uh, so the whole bulgy shape of the earth gets transformed gets shifted and the equatorial bulge occurs on a different portion of the earth you can visualize that in your mind right right okay so now what was quito ecuador and uh, south america the northern part of south america all along the equator that's moved out of there and now new jersey and North Carolina become the new equator. Now New Jersey starts to bulge outward, and land masses start to rise up from the sea off the coast of New Jersey and New York. And because it's bulging out there, that's the new equator. Whereas the old equator, where it's the northern part of Venezuela, for example, the northern part of Central of South America, that bulge now goes southward, and it begins to contract. All that land around Venezuela sinks beneath the sea because the bulge is no longer there. Do you, do you, you can visualize that probably, right? Mm-hmm. So sure. now this is why you've got land masses that sink in some areas and other land masses that actually arise out of the oceans. And incidentally, what, re, what that reminds me of is an ancient uh, scripture, not even a scripture, it's from a, uh, an anth- anthology. It's a book of written by men, historical records, ancient historical records of the past destruction, and I'll I'll paraphrase it. I have it here somewhere in one of the books, but rather than find it right now, I can paraphrase it. It says, these ancient people wrote that the destroyer will appear again. They call it the destroyer. They said, you know, normally in normal times, the earth rotates normally and the stars can be predicted. The motion of the stars can be predicted simply because the earth is moving in a regular way and every time every so many years you can see certain constellations out there but a time occurs when the destroyer approaches now the stars become chaotic and they begin to swirl around in the sky at first very slightly they begin to shift and you can no longer predict the position of the stars that's because the earth is beginning to take on a slight wobble but as the wobble becomes more accentuated and rapid then the stars actually appear like they're swirling in the sky chaotically. And they say when the destroyer approaches, blood when cause, we will cause blood to drop upon the earth. Now that's flaming meteors. Meteors get hot from the air friction as they plummet to the earth. Meteors that are being gravitationally dragged in by this body. They, it looks like blood, flaming blood. And the Bible talks about it. Hail mingled with fire and blood is cast to the earth. That's what the book of Revelation talks about will happen toward in these end times. Fire mingled with blood. So when blood drops upon the earth, the, the ancient Colbrin uh, historians state, then the destroyer is passing by, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ash. Seas, 
land masses will rise out of the sea and the seas will boil. It says the sea will be swallowed up by the land, meaning that, wow, all of a sudden land starts jutting up out of the ocean and the seas begin to boil because of the heat that's generated within the earth and coming from these comets magnetically, magnetic heat, just like a microwave oven would magnetically bombard a plate of food and heat it up. So this is what happens when the earth begins to wobble and swirl around. So you have a whole shifting land masses sinking and land masses rising. I see. Okay. Kathleen, anything else? No, I I think that was just really interesting, and I thank you for explaining that all to me and give me something to um, think about. Yeah, I would say to just judging by the just by the loss of aircraft, the many aircraft that were lost over the Bermuda Triangle, this is a sort of probably or possibly an air turbulence phenomenon caused by electromagnetic mag- forces. Possibly, again, I don't know, but it's you know it sounds like credible or plausible speculation, magnetic forces deep beneath the seabed that are causing turbulence in the air, and we know the air can be electrically excited, that would cause whirlpools and in the air swirls or funnel clouds, and we're seeing a lot more funnel clouds now, that would pull an aircraft and pull it right off of its uh, stability and and bring it into a nosedive, actually. Yeah, suck it right in. Yeah. Okay, well... Again, Kathleen, thank you. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, we yeah, people, we're up people for a break. Stay away from, people should stay away from uh, the water. You know, we're getting so many reports on the Weather Channel. It seems like every day, water turbulence, uh, undertow, uh, currents that are causing drowning people, huge waves. That's another phenomenon, these massive rogue waves out at sea that are capsizing ships. They are this becoming more yeah. frequent. And then also waves on the shore that are like tremendous. People are getting, surfers are getting ruined, uh, hurt, injured, killed, drowned from these waves. And uh, they say, you know, undertow is, is horrible. It's very dangerous, so people need to stay away from the water. I would not be boating anymore if I were someone who likes boating. Yeah, I would. Uh, I might reconsider boating myself. Uh, I don't boat, but if I did, um, I may be reconsidering it. I don't know. Uh, Hold on with us, John. And Kathleen, thank you so much for the call. We've got to take one last break, and we'll come uh, back and finish up with John. This is late. Okay. And, uh, well, you know, it kind of is the end of the world. I know it. Uh, I know a lot has changed. And I'm not talking about just people and the way they behave, but uh, the planet itself, the weather patterns, the, the activity, the solar system activity as well. And you look at the sun and the different things going on there. We've got fireballs coming not only close anymore, but uh, impacting us. So, you know, there's a lot going on. And whether you buy the whole Planet X thing or if you're more of a, you know, it's Jesus is coming back type deal, however you view it, um, the fact of the matter is you cannot deny that these changes are happening and that there is evidence and plenty of it that these changes have taken place before. Now, me, you know, I never deny the fact that we are going through some trying times here on this earth, Um, not only with uh, the political structure, but uh, most definitely with the with Mother Nature, if you will. Um, You know, I just there's a lot of people out there who will tell you that they know exactly where Planet X is and that it's coming. It's going to do this, it's going to do that, whether it be uh, the aliens told them or whatever it might be. And I'm not picking on anybody. I'm just saying that there's a lot of people out there with different ideas on this. The fact of the matter is we really don't know when or where or how. We just know that, it, you know, something's going to happen. It's happened before on this planet. It's going to happen again. So it's not that I dismiss any of it. Um, it's just I, I'm a guy who likes facts. I like proof. And a lot of what John's saying here tonight um, does lay out some groundwork towards proof that we are going to go through and same things our ancestors have gone through on this planet, and that's magnetic uh, pole shifts, and that's actual pole shifts, um, like the woolly mammoth, frozen, with fresh vegetation in its mouth. I mean, you know, that happens pretty quick for the woolly mammoth to be frozen like that. So, you know, I'm not in denial, that's for sure. And I know that uh, 
I'm not Superman. I'm not going to, you know, who knows? I don't know if I'll live through the changes or if I'll even see them in my lifetime. I assume I will. It certainly feels like I will. But uh, whether I survive or not, I leave that up to God because I do believe in God. Um, I do believe in a, a, a higher power. And um, I don't believe, however, that we're going to get help from God or aliens. Or- I wrote a report about that, and I posted it today. Um, I'm trying to find the article that I have. Well, I don't. I, I can. I can quote it for you. The third secret of Fatima. This sounds fantastic. But in 1917, three peasant girls in Fatima, Portugal, saw a vision, and it sounds kind of hokey and it's or questionable anyway. But when you look at the, what the secret was, or, or other vi- girls who have had similar visions, then you begin to see that there is a great deal of credibility in it. Uh, I, I do believe that the third secret of Fatima was indeed given by an angel of God to these girls back in 1917, and the third secret was, well, uh, led up to the very chronological end of the world. In order to present, to give us solid credibility for that cer- third secret of Fatima, I'd like to qu- quickly go over the girls in Garabondo of Spain, Garabondo, Spain, 1964, these four sisters, young young girls, were out picking apples in a field. It was clear skies. All of a sudden, there was a loud boom, like thunder, very loud, like a bomb. One of the girls, whom I have on videotape, testifies, on a clear day, it sounded like a bomb. And all of a sudden, one of the girls falls to her knees in a trance, and the other girls think that she's ill, and you go to run for help, but all of a sudden they fall to their knees also in a trance and they are spoken to by an angel they have they've had many of these experiences they woke up from the trance and went back running uh excitedly to their families and to the to the townsfolk and told them that they had seen what they call the angel and there were many such experiences where they were talk, spoken with to the spoken to by this angel uh, and there was actually films. We see I have videotapes from a documentary that was made showing films of the girls when they were in this trance-like state, sort of like the same state that Edgar Casey was in when a spirit, I believe the spirit of God, gave him this power to heal people and to predict the future. He even said it was from God. Well, there was one night when the girls of Garibaldi told the townsfolk who were filming them, we want to be left alone. We're being told that there's something serious is going to be told to us by the angels. Well, it was called the Night of Screams. These girls were horrified at the vision that was given to them by the angel. And the person who recounts it, this woman who has studied and interviewed the children, uh, says that they said several things, but one of the things they said the angels told them was that at some time during these future disasters, no electric motor anywhere in the world would be operable. Now, that sounds like a very irrelevant and peculiar prophecy for a gir- girls to be relating. So it sounds like they did not make it up, like it was indeed given to them by some metaphysical spirit. No mo- electric motor will operate at a certain time. Well, I immediately picked up on it because of my knowledge of physics and electricity and magnetism and how that relates to this incoming gravitational magnetic body, planet X. And I realized that what happens is this object is, we discussed earlier, when, a, when any kind of a comet penetrates the outer heliosphere surrounding our solar system, that electrified gaseous heliosphere, the electrified protons, electric protons and the gas, which comprise the gas, cling to this incoming body. And now this body is saturated with positive electric charge, plasma. And um, that's what forms the tail of the comet. And it it has a glowing tail because it's electrified. Now, uh, when it comes in, because it's moving, moving electric charge, anytime you have moving electric charge, you have an electromagnetic field that is generated, that billows out around the path of that moving charged object. So when Planet X comes in or one of its accompanying gravitationally captured comets, they're all saturated with plasma, a magnetic field billows out around the 
flight path of this incoming comet, just as a chemtrail would billow out around the flight path of an airplane. Now, this billowing invisible magnetic field expands greater to be greater and greater in size as it passes in the flight path, like a chemtrail. And this magnetic field then engulfs the entire Earth. And it penetrates Earth the way it cuts through Earth in the same way that a ghost would walk through a wall or pass through a wall. And the entire Earth is engulfed with this powerful magnetic field from this moving, massive, charged body. And as a result, all the electric fields, the tiny little, well, the tiny, the electric fields individually created within each motor on the Earth, the thousands of electric motors, all those electric fields would be canceled out, wiped out, erased, nullified by this massive Earth-engulfing magnetic field from this passing space body. And that is how, very logically, based upon physics, all electric motors on Earth could be made inoperable. There is no way that these unschooled peasant girls could have made this up. Clearly, this prophecy that every motor, electric motor on Earth would become inoperable must have been given to them by an angel of God. Now, yeah, uh, that would be kind of like an EMP, wouldn't it? Sort of, yeah, an electromagnetic, right. Mm -hmm. And rather than being a pulse, yeah, it would, it's a burst. An EMP would be an electromagnetic burst, you're right. And that, we, as we know, would destroy all electronics um, that's, that are unshielded. So this, to me, yeah. this is, presents clear evidence to anyone, any uh, unbiased observer, that these girls were actually given visions and messages by a metaphysical being, an angel of God. Now, only God would speak to people and warn them about the destruction that God says in the Bible that he himself is creating, will create, because mankind has drifted from him. So it makes perfect sense to me that all this is ordained by God because the angels warn that this is going to happen. And furthermore, the research that this woman did who, who relates what the testimony that she got from interviewing these women, and one of them was still alive and testifying. In fact, there's a couple of them that are still alive because it was only 1964 in Garibondal. Uh They say that uh, the, this will come from God. The angel told them this is a chastisement from God, and also that there would come a time when there would be a great, this is kind of harrowing and scary to think about. They say there come, would come a time when there will be a great thirst all around the world, and people will attempt to kill one another. Now, they didn't relate the great thirst to people attempting to kill one another. They just, just related what they heard. The great thirst mm -hmm. and people will attempt to kill one another. I deduce that what that is, what that means is they will be so thirsty that they will kill each other just to drink their blood. That's what I was thinking. It's horrible. It, it's really so... It and in the Bible, it's sad to say, but in the Old Testament, God promises to do these kinds of things, to force people to get, make them so hungry, they will actually cannibalize one another. But it sounds like a very cruel God that people don't want yeah, to accept. It does. But then if you had a, a judge that said to you, look, if you commit this crime, you're going to jail for life. I, I don't like that judge, but I better darn well take him seriously. Same thing yeah. with God. Now, God says, hey, I'll, I'll die for you. I am dying. I will die for you. I have died for you so that you won't have to take the punishment that my perfection requires. I will take your punishment, and I will, even at the last moment of your life, if you call out to me, I will save you. That's the greatest love and graciousness that anyone could ever expect. So you have both extremes with God. You have the willingness to forgive up to and accept and embrace and give eternal life up to the very last moment before the destruction of the world. And if that is rejected, if God's calling is rejected right up to the end, then comes the harsh chastisement. Well, he won't get no resistance from me, that's for sure. <laughs> Not from me either. When I was a belligerent atheist and I was a, suddenly in fear of, for my life, I actually spoke to God, and that's something that 
no even so called good Christians don't really do. They pretend to pray, but they don't really believe that God is there listening. Well, to a certain extent they do, but you know, it's kind of half hearted. But me, a belligerent atheist, saved me. Uh, and I looked, and even then, I, I was, remained an atheist, even after that, for years, until finally, God drew me. Now, it wasn't me, but it was circum- circumstances in my life where God brought me to, to recognize him and to embrace him, his spirit. Well, anyway, here's some evidence that shows you scientific evidence of the acknowledgement by our government of Planet X before they said, Hold it. Put a lid on that. Don't talk about that anymore. Our wonderful evil, I should say evil national security agency that we're hearing so much about told NASA, because they control all the government agencies, they told NASA, stop putting out these reports. Do not mention Planet X anymore. How do I know that? Well, I can, I can, in, I can deduce that that's what they told NASA, because once they had discovered Planet X, and I've got the newspaper articles, which I photocopied from my county library, proving that they were out. They knew Planet X was there. They went to look for it. They found it. They discovered it. They heralded it in major newspapers. And then they were told to shut up and don't say any more about it. And ever since then, the subject has been blacked out. There's more proof that that Planet X does exist because when you have a cover-up, the cover-up itself is more compelling proof of the crime cover-up of the crime is compelling proof like with the Kennedy assassination. They went through such elaborate cover-ups that, and as Jim Mars, a great Kennedy assassination researcher and and author, Jim Mars says the totality of the cover-up evidence itself is so great that the cover-up in itself proves that he was assassinated by a high-level conspiracy. Well, anyway, here's the cover. The cover-up was for many years. But here's the original article that was issued well, I've got four articles that were issued back in 1983. New York Times, January 30th, 1983, title, Clues Get Warm in the Search for Planet X. This is the actual article photocopied from the New York Times. Clues Get Warm in the Search for Planet X by John Noble Wilford. Quote, something out there beyond the farthest reaches of the known solar system seems to be tugging at Uranus and Neptune. Some gravitational force keeps perturbing the two giant planets causing irregularities in their orbits. The force suggests a presence far away and unseen, a large object that may be the long-sought planet X. Evidence assembled in recent years has led several groups of astronomers to renew the search for the 10th planet. They are devoting more time to visual observations with the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar in California. They are tracking two pioneer spacecraft now approaching the orbit of distant Pluto to see if variations in their trajectories provide clues to the source of this mysterious force. And incidentally, those two pioneer spacecraft indeed reported, transmitted back, radio transmitted back to NASA, their trajectory deviation, the deviation from their trajectory, which would have been caused by a massive object. Those space probes, Pioneer 10 and 11, Pioneer 10 was sent out to the point in space, in deep space, beyond Pluto, the point where the scientists and astronomers had calculated that this massive force existed, gravitational body existed, pulling on the orbital paths of the planets Uranus and Neptune. So now they simply sent out the probes to that point where their calculations said it would be. And indeed, the deviations, the gravitational pull deviated or drifted those that space probe, Pioneer 10, off of its orbit, off its trajectory. And so I'll continue reading. So we have evidence right there. And they're hoping that a satellite-borne telescope launched last week will detect heat signatures from this planet or whatever it is out there. The infrared astronomical satellite was boosted into a 560-mile high polar orbit, probably around the South Pole, South Pole orbit, Tuesday night from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. It represents an $80 million venture by the United States, Britain, and the Netherlands. So here you had three nations basically looking for this object, three governments, three space agencies, all knowing that this object, which they have named, 
It's not a science fiction name made up by a bunch of, uh, you know, people. With a That's right. Imaginative people. But it is a name officially given, Planet X, given by Percival Lowell, a famed astronomer who constructed a an observatory back around uh, 1910 to find this object, and he called the object Planet X. And the NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States government itself has continued calling it Planet X in their internal documents, one of which is titled The Search for Planet X, which you can find now on the Internet. It's no longer, somehow it's been leaked out. But anyway, three nations knew about it. So Netherlands, the United States, and Britain, they've sent up this infrared astronomical satellite. Quote, in the next six or seven months, this telescope is expected to conduct a wide-ranging survey of nearly all the sky, detecting sources not of ordinary light but of infrared radiation, which is invisible to the human eye and largely absorbed by the atmosphere. Scientists thus hope that the new telescope will chart thousands of infrared-emitting objects that have gone undetected, stars, interstellar clouds, asteroids, and... With any luck, this object that pulls at Uranus and Neptune, and it goes on and on, it talks about how, uh, I'll just paraphrase, how even back in the, in the early 1800s, this astronomers noticed that the, uh, when they discovered Uranus and Neptune, uh, Uranus was discovered in 1781, imagine that, and um, they noticed perturbations, that there were irregularities at, certain, at a certain point in the orbit of these planets, and they correctly assumed that it was caused by a gravitational body far out. So you could not see it, but you could see the gravitational pull that it was exerting on these outer planets, and that's why they knew it existed. So, and it goes on to say that Clyde Tombaugh, well, Clyde Tombaugh was a famous astronomer who discovered Pluto. He was looking for Planet X, and he accidentally discovered Pluto. He was at the Lowell Observatory in 1930, Percival Lowell's observatory, and discovered Pluto. Well, they said, well, Pluto's too small, but it's nice that you discovered it, but it's too small to be this massive gravitationally pulling object that we're looking for. So they continued to search for it. And this article says, I'm getting close to the end of the other article. I skipped quite a bit to save time. Quote, recent okay. calculations by the United States Naval Observatory have confirmed the orbital perturbation exhibited by Uranus and Neptune, which Dr. Thomas C. Van Flandern, an astronomer at the observatory, says could be explained by, quote, a single undiscovered planet, unquote. He and a colleague, Dr. Robert Harrington, Incidentally, he's dead, and many many people believe Dr. Harrington was murdered because he was about to reveal telescopic images of an incoming Planet X. So he died very rapidly. Again, I people see. Believe he was murdered, and I can give yeah, you more it's... evidence about to indicate that he was murdered. Okay, we've One got about of... six oh. minutes, uh, John. So we'll go right ahead. I want to hear it. Okay, but... <laughs> in the obituary, when he died. Just before he was about to reveal this telescopic images that he had taken of Planet X to determine, is it there? Yes, it was there. Is it incoming? We believe yes. He was about to, re to release this to the world. He never got a chance. In January 1992, he died of rapid onset cancer in a matter of a couple of weeks. They give people cancer. This is well known. It's a nice way to kill people with, and without making it seem like it was foul play. Well, why was not the information revealed? Why were not the photographic evidence revealed to the public showing this planet? It was concealed. There's evidence right there that he was murdered. Even if the man died of natural causes, they still should have released the photographs of Planet X, but they didn't want anybody to know about it, and the subject was blacked out in the press for the last 30 years, ever since the discovery of it. Uh, another thing, they did an obituary. The U.S. Naval Observatory did an obituary for their chief astronomer, Dr. Robert S. Harrington. And they said in the obituary that they really incriminated themselves by saying this. Oh, at the end of his career, Bob Harrington really lost all interest in Planet X, which is, we know, <laughs> is a complete lie. It's a gross lie because this was a pursuit of this man's life. I mean, was, any astronomer would have considered that the greatest discovery in history. And Dr. Harrington devoted his whole life to that. Pursuit. So we know that somebody from the NSA 
you know, the U.S. Naval Observatory, they're not a bunch of spies and spooks. They would not do something like that. But some probably some creep from the NSA got in there and said, throw this into the report because we don't want them to think that Harrington got, died because he discovered this Planet X. So throw this little comment in there. Say, oh, Bob lost all interest in, in Planet X during the last year or so of his life. Well, by saying that, making that unsolicited comment, which was in, unbelievable, they incriminated themselves. <clears throat> and this shows another, to me, is quite clear, to many people, quite clear evidence that he was murdered. So they kill people over this. And others that no, I were agree. too. And I'll tell you, John, uh, you know, uh, talking with you tonight, you've, you've piqued my interest again where I want to go back and look at uh, different things and see if I can find anything else. I mean, boy, I wish I, I wish somebody could get their hands on those pictures and release well, them. But I, I have nobody, a, oh, nobody will. Oh, oh right. I have to, Michael, I have to tell you real quickly. Here's something you mentioned at Fatima. Okay, the girls at Fatima, what happened was the, one of the sisters, the others died at the – swine flu, Spanish flu of 1917, 1918, but one survived, Lucia. She became a nun. Now, there's photographic evidence, and I just put a report out. Someone was doing research, not only someone, that, an informant of mine that I spoke with a few years ago, but somebody else, Marian Horvat, put out a report showing photographic evidence that absolutely proves that this sister Lucia, which became a nun and became very aged and lived in a cloistered uh, convent until she died, supposedly died just a few years ago, she was not the real sister Lucia. She was a phony sister Lucia. Uh, and that phony sister Lucia existed for many years. The real sister Lucia probably was murdered in the early 1940s. She was told to be quiet and never mention a word about that third secret of Fatima to anyone except to the Vatican. Evidently, photographic evidence that I posted today from Mar Marian Horvat shows that the Sister Lucia that the church has represented as being, you know, the girl who saw the, was given the message of the third secret is a phony. You've got to see okay. that report. It's fantastic. Yeah, please, if you uh, think about it, if you can remember, please send it to me, and um, you know, and yeah, also I, send me links to the articles you spoke of, and and I'll post them. But I have a couple of questions from the chat, if we can get a quick answer. Okay. Um, one is where is Planet X right now, and the other is, uh, are you aware of the large black triangle object in the sun? Um, where's Planet X? I I don't know. I mean, only NASA knows. I mean, we have. Many, many of us believe that it's in. He's running away from you, and you're grabbing him from the back of his suspenders. You're pulling him backward. He's going to decelerate. That's exactly what happens as this object overshoots the sun. Then this, instead of the sun pulling it toward it and accelerating it, now the sun is pulling it back because it overshot, and it, it's decelerating it, and now it makes a big looping U-turn around the sun. That's going to take several years. According to the people in uh, the Edgar Casey in Atlantis who went into a trance and, and saw what happened in the past thousands of years ago when the same destruction occurred in Atlantis, there were two destructions separated by a period of years. I believe that period of years was three and a half years, the same time that's predicted by the Bible as being the rule, period of rule and reign by the global Antichrist, three and a half years. The first passage is going to be the destruction when it comes over Earth's pass on its way over the top of the sun. It's going to cause a certain amount of destruction. Then it goes over the top of the sun, and then it has to pass over Earth's orbital path a second time. I believe my speculation is that it's three and a half years between the first passage on its way over the top of the sun to the second passage over Earth on its way after it passes over the top of the sun and back out. Three and a half years. Uh, so oh, anyway, yeah. it's making a U-turn, and we don't know where it is right now, but it's probably from our best guess, in distant, making that big U-turn out around Saturn someplace because we're seeing storms on Saturn, all right? And that's sort of circumstantial evidence. Uh, now, the, I'm not sure about this. So there's the sun. There is an object called Ison, and Marshall Masters has actually photographs of it that were taken before the observatory in Costa Rica was shut down, or people were, photographs were prohibited after Marshall Masters had captured this photograph of this object. You, uh, it's it's very compelling. It's absolutely there, yeah. and that's the object that looks like a, an object near the sun.
so these people back in the early 80s, they, many scientists and uh, people in the movie industry were trying to, knew that there might be a possibility of a pole shift. They thought the pole shift might be caused by a huge, by, by an alignment of planets, of Jupiter lining up with Saturn, lining up with Mars and Earth, and it, they thought the combined gravitational pull of all these planets in the year 2000 would pull the Earth off of its axis and cause global destruction. They didn't know about Planet X then, but they were on the right track. So they wanted to find proof that this pole shift had occurred in the past. So they got Alex Tannis, and Alex Tannis on, the, on this videotape says, I went into the Bermuda Triangle. A part of me went out of my body and swam deep beneath the ocean. And I saw the most marvelous ancient civilization down below the ocean. I saw marble staircases, spiral staircases, marble columns, marble roadways. It was the most pyramids. It was the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in my life. He did an out-of-body experience. I mean, I've never believed in that, but I can see the proof of it <clears throat> from the from – the, uh, testimony of Alex Tannis. And uh, then in this videotape, they said well, a lot of people did not believe Alex Tannis, but we went out to the coordinates where he had described to us, which he had described to us, 40 miles off the coast of Florida. It's called the Bimini Road. And sure enough, they found a 1,000-yard long road made of marble. Of course, it's now encrusted with coral and everything. But when he saw it in his vision, he saw it as it existed thousands of years ago before it sunk beneath the sea. It was a part of it. It was then a part of the ancient continent of Atlantis. And he, uh, they, they stopped the boat right there and they used sonar to look down and they detected this undersea pyramid with the capstone missing. So with the capstone missing, that tells you that this was Illuminati, this was the ancient occult practice that was being, that was worshipped and followed thousands of years ago. So the evil, evil mankind has not changed because the same evil spirits that ruled mankind over the millennia are at work creating these occult worship symbols such as the pyramid without the capstone. But they use sonar and they look down and you actually see on the videotape a video sonar picture of a pyramid deep on the ocean bottom, 40 miles off the coast of Florida. This pyramid has no capstone. It's just incredible, and you have to believe it. So there's and more evidence that the earth was sunk. Yeah, I was just going to say that should uh, be enough for people to realize. And I think what a lot of people feel is, you know, they, they you know, especially when you're young, you've got this feeling of, indestructibility like well that, that can't happen because i'm here and i have news for people well, it doesn't matter who's here <laughs> when it's going to happen it's going to happen and it is going to happen at some point well you know, it seems that some point is getting close to us in time yeah. right now because if you talk to some of the young people that you know we think are we have a youth, you're right young people have this feeling of eternality uh indestructibility but if you see some of them and many many thousands and a growing number are being subjected to these horrible weather disasters. Entire houses, and we've all seen it, it's horrible, it's sad, it's tragic. We feel for those people. But these young people see their house turned into a pile of debris, wreckage, so grotesque that you just can't imagine how could they ever clean up all that wreckage that was once a yeah. house. And now they've got no place to live. Those people are painfully aware of how destructive this world is becoming the weather the tornadoes are super tornadoes now it's all evidence it's all evidence right before your eyes in living color and some people unfortunately people have actually felt the pain of the evidence super tornadoes miles wide they never used to be that wide tornadoes used to be much narrower tornadoes were never never had the high wind speeds that they do now no, they look like the last hurricanes one on the land, though. Yes, that's another thing. Land hurricanes, they call them derechos. 
Derechos were, I never even heard of a derecho in all my life. And now we're getting them. Um, but these hurricanes, the one that destroyed uh, more Oklahoma, oh, how tragic, that had wind speed of around 300 miles an hour. I mean, it's, you know, that's a circular rotational speed. I mean, that is incredible. I mean, that's a record. I think that broke a record. There was no, nothing ever has been recorded at that high of velocity, no tornado. And the wind yeah, you know, miles wide. John, I've looked at, you know, yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I always thought of tornadoes as these, you know, somewhat small funnel clouds and, and if you were in its path, you were in trouble. But, you know, now it's like, like you said, they're so wide that, you know, you're going to be in its path. It's, it's like, like we just said, it's like a hurricane just traveling across land. It's unbelievable. I, I tell you, I watch the Weather Channel, and sometimes I cannot believe what I'm seeing. And I think a lot of, you know, especially the younger people, again, they look at this and they, they don't know any different. They think it's normal. It's far well, from normal. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, uh, here's another crazy anomaly that shows the Earth is in trouble. These experience weather uh, hurricane or tornado chasers, these tornado chasers, uh, were, they were playing it safe. They knew that if you stay on the south side, I think they, the Weather Channel was saying this, if you stay on the south side of the tornado, you're okay because the tornado always moves toward the northeast. However... For the first time ever, the tornado, instead of moving northeast, it moved south. And it killed three very dedicated, experienced tornado hunters. Yeah. So the weather is getting horrible. The flooding is epic levels. I mean, record flooding over and over again. It, you know, far more than we've ever had in the past, far greater water levels. Cars being washed away day after day. You see this all over the country. I can't even begin to tell you all the different places that have been severely flooded, homes destroyed. We all, you know it, you see it. I don't even have to go into details, oh, yeah. right? And then the drought. Oh, yeah, right next door, one state away, you'll have a drought where the ground is so cracking so much, a long-term drought, that the, the ground is shrinking and cracking and the foundation of the house is collapsing because the earth is so dry. That's close, right? you know, adjacent to a flooded area. A flooded area. Yeah. So it's really, we know the earth is in trouble. We don't even have to, I mean, I could go on, we could go on and on and spend two hours talking about the weather anomalies. If people will believe, they have to, that the earth is in big trouble. And uh, getting back real quick, I'll give you my theory, and I've written this up formally and trying to present it to many people who uh, might pass it on to others so as to warn the world. I, my theory that I began to explain before as to what is happening to Earth's magnetic field. Well, the magnetic field's getting messed up because of the swirling molten iron core of the Earth that I talked about before. Uh, the the Earth, solar winds blasting and impinging upon Earth's magnetic field, the electromagnetic energy from those solar winds impacting Earth's magnetic field is feeding back, just like in, for, from the skin of the apple into the core of the apple, into Earth's core, and that energy is not only heating up the Earth's core, but it's putting a force, budging force, nudging force on the solid iron core at the very center of the Earth, which is immersed in the liquid molten iron core. That center iron core, that pit, more or less, of the Earth is getting nudged off of its center. 